Hello students and welcome to our final installment of Margaret Atwood's Oryx and Craig. This is chapter 13. Bubble. In the aftermath of the storm, the air is cooler. Mist rises from the distant trees, the sun declines, the birds are beginning their evening racket. Three crows are flying overhead, their wings black flames, their words almost audible. Crake, crake, they're saying. The crickets are saying oryx. I'm hallucinating, thinks Snowman. He progresses along the rampart, step by wrenching step. His foot feels like a gigantic boiled wiener stuffed with hot, masticated flesh, boneless and about to burst. Whatever bug is fermenting inside is evidently resistant to the antibiotics in the watchtower ointment. Maybe in paradise, in the jumble of Craig's ransacked emergency storeroom, he knows how ransacked it is. He did the ransacking himself. He'll be able to find something more effective. Craig's emergency storeroom. Craig's wonderful plan. Craig's cutting-edge ideas. Craig, king of, king of crakery, because Craig is still there, still in possession, still the ruler of his own domain. However dark that bubble of light has now become, darker than dark, and some of that darkness is snowman's. He helps with it. Let's not go there, says Snowman. Sweetie, you're already there. You never left. At the eighth watchtower, the one overlooking the park surrounding Paradise, he checks to see if either of the doors leading to the upper room are unlocked. He'd prefer to descend by a stairway if possible, but they aren't. Cautiously, he surveys the ground below through one of the observation slits. No large or medium-sized life forms visible down there, though there's a scuttering in the underbrush he hopes is only a squirrel. He unpacks his twisted sheet, ties it to a ventilation pipe, flimsy but the only possibility, and lowers the free end over the edge of the rampart. It's about seven feet short, but he can stand the drop as long as he doesn't land on his bad foot. Over he goes, hand over hand, down the air sass rope. He hangs at the end of it like a spider, hesitates. Isn't there a technique for doing this? What has he read about parachutes? Something about bending your knees, and then he lets go. He lands two-footed. The pain is intense, but after rolling around on the muddy ground for a time and making speared animal noises, he hauls himself up, whimpering to his feet, revision to his foot. Nothing seems to be broken. He looks around for a stick to use as a crutch, find one, finds one. Good thing about sticks, they grow on trees. Now he's thirsty. Through the verdure and upspringing weeds he goes, hoppity, hoppity, hop, gritting his teeth. On the way, he steps on a huge banana slug and almost falls. He hates that feeling, cold, viscous, like a peeled refrigerator muscle, creeping snot. If he were a Quaker, he'd have to apologize to it. I'm sorry I stepped on you, child of Oryx. Please forgive my clumsiness. He tries it out. I'm sorry. Did he hear something? An answer? When the slugs begin to talk, there is no time to lose. He reaches the bubble dome, circles around the white, hot, icy swell of it to the front. The airlock is open as he remembers it. A deep breath, and in he goes. Here are Crake and Oryx, what's left of them. They've been vulturized. They're scattered here and there, small and large bones mingled and in disarray, like a giant jigsaw puzzle. Here's Snowman, thick as a brick, dunderhead, frivol, and dupe. Water running down his face, giant fist clenching his heart staring down at his one true love and his best friend in all the world. Craig's empty eye sockets look up at Snowman as his empty eyes once before. He's grinning with all the teeth in his head. As for Oryx, she's face down. She's turned her head away from him as if in mourning. The ribbon in her hair is as pink as ever. Oh, how to lament. He's a failure even at that. Snowman goes through the inner doorway, past the security area, into the staff living quarters. Warm air, humid, unfresh. The first place he needs is the storeroom. He finds it without difficulty, dark except for a few skylights, but there he's got a flashlight. There's a smell of mildew and of rats or mice, but otherwise the place is untouched since he was last here. He locates the medical supply shelves, roots around, tongue depressors, gauze pads, burn dressings, a box of rectal thermometers, but he doesn't need one of them stuffed up his anus to tell him he's burning up. Three or four kinds of antibiotics, pill form and therefore slow acting, plus one last bottle of Crate's super germicide short-term plea bland cocktail. 
get you there and back, but don't stay until the clock strikes midnight or you'll turn into a pumpkin, is what Crank used to say. He reads the label, Crake's precise notations, estimates the measurement. He's so weak now, he can hardly lift the bottle. It takes him a while to get the top off. Glug, 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 says his voice balloon down the hatch. But no, he shouldn't drink it. He finds a box of clean syringes and shoots himself up. Bite the dust, foot germs, he says. Then he hobbles to his own suite, what used to be his own suite, and collapses into the damp, unmade bed and goes brown out. Alex the parrot comes to him in a dream. It flies in through the window, lands close to him on the pillow, bright green this time, with purple wings and a yellow beak, glowing like a beacon, and snowman is suffused with happiness and love. It coughs its head, looks at him first with one eye and then the other. The blue triangle, it says. Then it begins to flush, to turn red, beginning with the eye. This changing is frightening, as if the parrot-shaped light bulb filling up with blood. I'm going away now, it says. No, wait, snowman calls, or wants to call. His mouth won't move. Don't go yet. Tell me. Then there's a rush of wind. Woof, and Alex is gone. And snowman is sitting up in his former bed in the dark, drenched in sweat. Scribble. The next morning his foot is somewhat better. The swelling has gone down. The pain has decreased. When evening falls, he'll give himself another shot of Craig's super drug. He knows he can't overdo it, however. The stuff is very potent. Too much of it, and his cells will pop like grapes. Daylight filters through the insulating glass bricks facing the skylight window well. He roams around the space he once inhabited, feeling like a disembodied sensor. Here is his closet. Here are the clothes once his, tropical weight shirts and shorts, ranged neatly on hangers and beginning to molder. Footwear, too, but he can no longer stand the thought of footwear. It would be like adding hooves, plus his infected foot might not fit. Under pants and stacks on the shelves, why did he used to wear such garments? They appear to him now as some sort of weird bondage gear. In the storeroom, he finds some packets and cans. For breakfast, he has cold ravioli and tomato sauce and half a jolt bar washed down with a warm Coke. No hard liquor or beer left. He'd gone through all of that during the weeks he'd been sealed in here. Just as well, his impulse would have been to drink it up as fast as possible. Turn all memory to white noise. No hope of that now. He's stuck in time past. The wet sand is rising. He's sinking down. After he'd shot Crake, he recoated the inner door, sealed it shut. Crake and Oryx lay intertwined in the airlock. He couldn't bear to touch them, so he'd left them where they were. He'd had a fleeting romantic impulse. Maybe he should cut off a piece of Oryx's dark braid, but he resisted it. He went back to his room and drank some scotch and then some more, as much as it took to conk himself out. When he woke up, uh, sorry, what woke him up was the buzzer from the outer door. White Sedge and Black Rhino trying to get back in. The others too, no doubt. Jimmy ignored them. Sometime the next day, he made four slices of soy toast, forced himself to eat them drank a bottle of water. His entire body felt like a stubbed toe, numb, but also painful. During the day, a cell phone rang a high-ranking corpsman looking for Crake. Tell that fucker to get his big fat brain the fuck over here and help figure this thing out. He isn't here, said Jimmy. Who is this? I can't tell you. Security protocol. Listen, whoever you are, I have an idea what sort of scam that creeps up to, and when I lay my hands on him, I'm going to break his neck. I bet he's got that vaccine for this, and he's going to hold us up for an arm and a leg. Really? Is that what you think, said Jimmy? I know the bastard's there. I'm coming over to blow the door in. I wouldn't do that, said Jimmy. We're seeing some very strange microbe activity here. Very unusual. The place is hotter than hell. I'm toughing it out in a bio suit, but I really don't know whether I'm contaminated or not. Something's really gone off the rails. Oh, shit. Here? In Riju? I thought we were sealed off. Yeah, it's a bad break, said Jimmy. My advice is look in Bermuda. I think he went there with a lot of cash. So he sold us out, the little shit. Hopped it deliberately to the competition. That would figure. That would absolutely figure. Listen, thanks for the tip. Good luck, said Jimmy. Yeah, sure. Same to you. Nobody else buzzed the outer door. Nobody tried to break in. The Riju folks must have got the message. As for the staff, once they'd realized the guards were gone, they must have rushed outside and made a beeline for the outer gate for what they confused with freedom. Three times a day, Jimmy checked on the Quakers, peering in at them like a voyeur. 
scrapped the simile. He was a voyeur. They seemed happy enough, or at least contented. They grazed. They slept. They sat for long hours doing what appeared to be nothing. The mothers nursed the babies. The young ones played. The men peed in the circle. One of the women came into her blue phase, and the men performed their courtship dance, singing, flowers in hand, as your penises waving in time. And then there was a quintuplet fertility fest of off among the shrubbery. Maybe I could do some social interaction, thought Jimmy. Help them invent the wheel, leave a legacy of knowledge, pass on all my words. No, he couldn't. No hope there. Sometimes they looked uneasy. They'd gather in groups. They'd murmur. The hidden mics picked them up. Where is Oryx? When is she coming back? She always comes back. She should be here teaching us. She is always teaching us. She is teaching us now. Is she here? Here and not here is the same thing for Oryx. She said that. Yes, she did. She said that. What does it mean? It was like some demented theology debate in the windier chat rooms of uh, Limbo. Jimmy couldn't stand listening to it for very long. The rest of the time he himself grazed, slept, sat for long hours doing nothing. For the first two weeks he followed world events on the net or else on the television news, the riots in the cities as transportation broke down and supermarkets were raided. The explosions as electrical systems failed, the fires no one came to extinguish. Crowds packed the churches, mosques, synagogues, and temples to pray and repent, then poured out of them as the worshippers woke up to the increased risk of exposure. There was an exodus to small towns and rural areas whose inhabitants fought off the refugees as long as they could with banned firearms or clubs and pitchforks. At first, the news newscasters were thoroughly into it, filming the action from traffic helicopters, exclaiming as if at a football match, Did you see that? Unbelievable. Brad, nobody can quite believe it. What we've just seen is a crazed mob of God's gardeners liberating a chicky knob's production facility. Brad, this is hilarious. Those chicky knob things don't even walk. Laughter. Now, back to the studio. It must have been during the initial mayhem, thanks, Snowman, that some genius let the pagoons and wool logs out. Oh, Thanks a bundle. Street preachers took to self-flagellation and ranting about the apocalypse, though they seemed disappointed. Where were the trumpets and angels? Why hadn't the moon turned to blood? Pundits and suits appeared on the screen, medical experts, graphs showing infection rates, maps tracing the extent of the epidemic. They used dark pink for that, as for the British Empire once. Jimmy would have preferred some other color. There was no disguising the fear of the commentators. Who's next, Brad? When are they going to have a vaccine? Well, Simon, they're working round the clock from what I hear, but nobody's claiming to have a handle on this thing yet. It's a biggie, Brad. Simon, you said a mouthful, but we've licked some biggies before. Encouraging grin, thumbs up, unfocused eyes, facial pallor. Documentaries were hastily thrown together with images of the virus. At least they'd isolated it. It looked like the usual melting gumdrop with spines, and commentary on its method. This appears to be a super virulent splice. Whether it's a species jumping mutation or a deliberate fabrication is anybody's guess. Sage nods all around. They've given the virus a name to make it seem more manageable. Its name was Juve, Jet Speed Ultra Virus Extraordinary. Possibly they now knew something such as what Craig had really been up to hidden safely in the deepest core of the re rejuvenescence compound, sitting in judgment on the world, thought Jimmy. But why had it been his right? Conspiracy theories pro proliferated. It was a religious thing. It was God's gardeners. It was a plot to gain world control. Boil water and don't travel advisories were issued in the first week. Handshaking was discouraged. In the same week, there was a run on latex gloves and nose cone filters, about as effective, thought Jimmy, as Oranges stuck with cloves during the Black Death. This just did. The Juve killer virus has broken out in Fiji, spared until now. Corsica chiefly uh, declares New New York a disaster area. Major arteries sealed off. Brad, this item is moving very fast. Simon, it's unbelievable. Change can be accommodated to any system depending on its rate, Craig used to say. Touch your head to a wall, nothing happens, but if the same head hits the same wall at 90 miles an hour, it's red paint. We're in a speed tunnel, Jimmy. When the water's moving faster than the boat, you can't control a thing. I listened, thought Jimmy, but I didn't hear. 
In the second week, there was full mobilization. The hastily assembled epidemic managers called the shots, field clinics, isolation tents, whole towns, then whole cities quarantined. But these efforts soon broke down as the doctors and nurses caught the thing themselves or panicked and fled. England closes ports and airports. All communication from India has ceased. Hospitals are off limits until further notice. If you feel ill, drink plenty of water and call the following hotline number. Do not, repeat, do not attempt to exit cities. It wasn't Brad talking anymore, or Simon. Brad and Simon were gone. It was other people and then others. Jimmy called the hotline number and got a recording saying it was out of service. And then he called his father, a thing he hadn't done in years. That line was out of service, too. He searched his email, no recent messages. All he found was an old birthday card he'd failed to delete. Happy birthday, Jimmy. May all your dreams come true. Pigs with wings. One of the privately run websites showed a map with lit up points on it for each place that was still communicating via satellite. Jimmy watched with fascination as the points of light blinked out. He was in shock. That must have been why he couldn't take it in. The whole thing seemed like a movie. Yet here he was, and there were Oryx and Craig, dead, in the airlock. Any time he found himself thinking it was an illusion, a practical joke of some kind, he went and looked at them. Through the bulletproof window, of course, he knew he shouldn't open the innermost door. He lived off Craig's emergency stores, the frozen good first. If the buzzle, bubble's solar system failed, the freezers and microwaves would no longer work, so he might as well eat his way through the Chicky Knob's gourmet dinners while he had the chance. He smoked up Craig's stash of skunkweed in no time flat. He managed to miss about three days of horror that way. He rationed the booze first, but soon he was getting through quite a pile of it. He needed to be fried just to face the news. He needed to be not feeling much. I don't believe it. I don't believe it, he'd say. He'd begun talking to himself out loud, a bad sign. It isn't happening. How could he exist in this clean, dry, monotonous, ordinary room, gobbling caramel soy corn and zucchini cheese puffs and addling his brain on spiritist liquors and brooding on the total fiasco that was his personal life while the entire human race was cacking out. The worst of it was that those people out there, the fear, the suffering, the wholesale death, did not really touch him. Craig used to say that Homo sapiens was not hardwired to individuate other people in numbers above 200, the size of the primal tribe, and Jimmy would reduce that number to two. Had Oryx loved him? Had she loved him not? Did Craig know about them? How much did he know? When did he know it? Was he spying on them all along? Did he set up that grand finale as an assisted suicide? Had he intended to have Jimmy shoot him because he knew what would happen next and he didn't deign to stick around to watch the results of what he'd done? Or did he know he wouldn't be able to withhold the formula for the vaccine once the Corsicor got to work on him? How long had he been planning this? Could it be that Uncle Pete and possibly even Craig's own mother had been trial runs? With so much at stake, was he afraid of failure, of being just one more incompetent nihilist? Or was he tormented by jealousy? Was he addled by love? Was it revenge? Did he just want Jimmy to put him out of his misery? Had he been a lunatic or an intellectually honorable man who thought things through to their logical conclusion? And was there any difference? And so on and so forth, spinning the emotional wheels and sucking down the hooch until he could blank himself out. Meanwhile, the end of a species was taking place before his very eyes. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. How many legs does it have? Homo sapiens sapiens, joining the polar bear, the beluga whale, the onager, the burrowing owl, the long, long list. Oh, Big points, Grandmaster. Sometimes he'd turn off the sound, whisper words to himself, succulent, morphology, pure blind, quarto, frass. It had a calming effect. Sight after sight, channel after channel went dead. A couple of the anchors, news jocks to the end, set the cameras to film their own deaths. The screams, the dissolving skins, the ruptured eyeballs and all. How theatrical, thought Jimmy. Nothing some people won't do to get on TV. He's cynical shit, he told himself, and then he started to weep. Don't be so fucking sentimental, Craig used to tell him. But why not? 
Why shouldn't he be sentimental? It wasn't as if there's anyone around to question his taste. Once in a while, he'd considered killing himself, and it seemed mandatory, but somehow he didn't have the required energy. Anyway, killing yourself with something you did for an audience, as on nightynight.com. Under the circumstances, the here and now, it was a gesture that lacked elegance. He could imagine Craig's amused contempt and the disappointment of Oryx. But Jimmy, why do you give up? You have a job to do. You promised, remember? Perhaps he failed to take seriously his own despair. Finally, there was nothing more to watch except old movies on DVD. He watched Humphrey Bogart and Edward G. Robinson and Key Largo. He wants more, don't you, Rocco? Yeah, that's it, more. That's right, I want more. Will you ever get enough? Or else he watched Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds, flap, 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 eek, screech. You could see the strings where the avian superstars were tied to the roof. Or he watched Night of the Living Dead, lurch, arg, gnaw, choke, gurgle. Such minor paranoias were soothing to him. Then he'd turn it off, sit in front of the empty screen. All the women he'd ever known would pass in front of his eyes in the semi-darkness. His mother, too, in her magenta dressing gown, young again. Oryx came last, carrying white flowers. She looked at him and then walked slowly out of his field of vision into the shadows where Crake was waiting. These reveries were almost pleasurable. At least while they were going on, everyone was still alive. He knew this state of affairs couldn't continue much longer. Inside Paradise proper, the Crakers were munching up the leaves and, graves fast, leaves and grasses faster than they could regenerate. And one of these days, the solar would fail, and the backup would fail, too, and Jimmy had no idea about how to fix those things. Then the earth circulation would stop, and the door lock would freeze, and both he and the Crakers would be trapped inside, and they'd all suffocate. He had to get them out while there was still time, but not too soon, or there would still be some desperate people out there, and desperate people would mean dangerous. What he didn't want was a bunch of disintegrating maniacs falling on their knees, clawing at him. Cure us, cure us. He might be immune from the virus, unless, of course, Craig had been lying to him, but not from the rage and despair of its carriers. Anyway, how could he have the heart to stand there and say, Nothing can save you. In the half-light and the dank, snowman wanders from space to space. Here, for instance, in his office, is his office. His computer sits on the desk, turning a blank face to him like a discarded girlfriend encountered by chance at a party. Beside the computer are a few sheets of paper, which must have been the last he'd ever written, the last he'd ever write. He picks them up with curiosity. What is it that the, Jim, that the Jimmy he'd once been had seen fit to communicate, or at least to record, to set down in black and white with smudges for the edification of the world that no longer existed? To whom it may concern, Jimmy had written in ballpoint rather than print out. His computer was fried by then. But he'd persevered laboriously by hand. He must still have had hope. He must have still believed that the situation could be turned around, that someone would show up here in the future, someone in authority, that his words would have meaning then, a context. As Craig had once said, Jimmy was a romantic optimist. I don't have much time, Jimmy had written. Not a bad beginning, thinks Snowman. I don't have much time, but I will try to set down what I believe to be the explanation for the recent catastrophe. I have gone through the computer of the man known here as Craig. He left it on deliberately, I believe, and I am able to report that the Jew virus was made here in the Paradise Dome by the splicers hand-selected by Craig and was then insisted in the Bliss Plus product. There was a time-lapse factor built in to allow for wide distribution. The first batch of virus did not become active until all selected territories had been seeded and the outbreak thus took the form of a series of rapidly overlapping waves. For the success of the plan, time was of the essence. Social disruption was maximized, and development of a vaccine effectively prevented. Craig himself had developed a vaccine concurrently with the virus, but he had destroyed it prior, prior to his death. Although various staff members of the Bliss Plus project contributed to Juve on a piecework basis, it is my belief that none with the exception of Craig was cognizant of what the effects would be. As for Craig's motives, I can only speculate. Perhaps. Here the handwriting stops. Whatever Jimmy's speculations might have been on the subject of Craig's motives, they had not been recorded. 
Snowman crumples the sheet up, drops them on the floor. It's the fate of those words to be eaten by beetles. He could have mentioned the change in Craig's fridge magnets. You could tell a lot about a person from their fridge magnets, not that he thought much about it at the time. Remnant. On the second Friday of March, he'd been marking off the days on a calendar, God knows why, Jimmy showed himself to the Quakers for the first time. He didn't take his clothes off. He drew the line at that. He wore a set of standard-issue rejuve khaki tropicals with mesh underarms and a thousand pockets and his favorite fake leather sandals. The Quakers gathered round him, gazing at him with quiet wonder. They'd never seen textiles before. The children whispered and pointed. Who are you, said the one Crake had christened Abraham Lincoln. A tall man, brown, Finnish. It was not said impolitely. From an ordinary man, Jimmy would have found it brusque, even aggressive, but these people didn't go for fancy language. They hadn't been taught evasion, euphemism, lily gilding. In speech, they were plain and blunt. My name is Snowman, said Jimmy, who had thought this over. He no longer wanted to be Jimmy, or even Jim, and especially not Thickney. His incarnation as Thickney hadn't worked out well. He needed to forget his past, the distant past, the immediate past, the past in any form. He needed to exist only in the present, without guilt, without expectation, as the Quakers did. Perhaps a different name would do that for him. Where have you come from, O oh snowman? I come from the place of Oryx and Crake, he said. Crake sent me, true, in a way, and Oryx. He keeps the sentence structure simple, the message clear. He knows how to do this from watching Oryx through the mirror wall and from listening to her, of course. Where has Oryx gone? She had some things to do, said Snowman. That was all he could come up with. Simply pronouncing her name had choked him up. Why have Crake and Oryx sent you to us, said the woman called Madame Curie, to take you to a new place. But this is our place. We are content where we are. Oryx and Crake, Crake wish you to have a better place than this, said Snowman, where there will be more to eat. There were nods, smiles, Oryx and Crake wished them well as they'd always known. It seemed to be enough for them. Why is your skin so loose, said one of the children. I was made in a different way from you, Snowman said. He was beginning to find this conversation of interest, like a game. These people were like blank pages. He could write whatever he wanted on them. Crake made me with two kinds of skin. One comes off. He took off his tropical vest to show them. They stared with interest at the hair on his chest. What is that? Those are feathers, little feathers. Oryx gave them to me as a special favor. See? More feathers grow out of my face. He lets the children touch his stubble. He'd been lax about shaving lately. There seemed to be no point to it, so his beard was sprouting. Yes, we see, but what are feathers? Oh, right, they've never seen any. Some of the children of Oryx have feathers on them, he said. That kind are called birds. We'll go to where they are, and then you'll know about feathers. Snowman marveled at his own facility. He was dancing gracefully around the truth, light-footed, light-fingered. But it was almost too easy. They accepted without question everything he said. Much more of this, whole days, whole weeks of it, and he could see himself screaming with boredom. I could leave them behind, he thought. Just leave them. Let them fend for themselves. They aren't my business. But he couldn't do that, because although the Quakers weren't his business, they were now his responsibility. Who else did they have? Who else did he have, for that matter? Snowman planned the route in advance. Crake's storeroom was well supplied with masks. He'd take the children of Crake to the seashore, where he himself had never been. It was something to look forward to. At least he would see the ocean. He'd walk on a beach, as in stories told by the grown-ups when he was young. He might even go swimming. It wouldn't be too bad. The Quakers could live in the park near the Arboretum, colored green on the map and marked with a tree symbol. They'd feel at home there, and certainly there'd be lots of edible foliage. As for himself, there'd surely be fish. He'd gathered together some supplies, not too much, not too heavy. He'd have to carry it all, and loaded up a spray gun with a full complement of virtual bullets. The evening before the departure, he gave a talk. On the way to their new place, better place, he would walk ahead, he said, with two of the men. He picked the tallest. Behind them would come the women and children, with a file of men to either side. The rest of the men would walk behind. They needed to do this because Craig had said that this was the proper way. It was best to avoid mentioning the possible dangers. Those would require too much explanation. 
If the Quakers noticed anything moving, anything at all, in whatever shape or form, they were to tell them at once. Some of the things they might see would be puzzling, but they were not to be alarmed. If they told them in time, these things would not be able to hurt them. Why would they hurt us? asked Sojourner Truth. They might hurt you by mistake, said Snowman, as the ground hurts you when you fall on it. But it is not the ground's wish to hurt us. Oryx has told us that the ground is our friend. It grows our food for us. Yes, said Snowman, but Crake made the ground hard, otherwise we would not be able to walk on it. It took them a minute to walk this one through. Then there was much nodding of heads. Snowman's brain was spinning. The illogic of what he just said dazzled him, but it seemed to have done the trick. In the dawn light, he punched the door code for the last time and opened up the bubble and led the Crakers out of paradise. They noticed the remnants of Crake lying on the ground, but as they had never seen Crake when alive, they believed Snowman when he told them that it was a thing of no importance, only a sort of husk, only a sort of pod. It would have been a shock to them to have witnessed their creator in the present state. As for Oryx, she was face down and wrapped in silk, no one they'd recognize. The trees surrounding the dome were lush and green. Everything seemed pristine. But when they reached the rejuvenescence compound proper, the evidence of destruction and death lay all around. Overturned golf carts, sodden, illegible printouts, computers with their guts ripped out, rubble, fluttering cloth, gnawed carry, and broken toys. The vultures were still at their business. Please, oh snowman, what is that? It's a dead body. What do you think? It's part of the chaos, said snowman. Crake and Oryx are clearing away the chaos for you because they love you, but they haven't quite finished yet. This answer, this answer seemed to content them. The chaos smells very bad, said one of the older children. Yeah, said Snowman, with something meant uh, for a smile. Chaos always smells bad. Five blocks from the main compound gate, a man staggered out of the side street, tore them. He was in the penultimate stages of the disease. The sweat of blood was on his forehead. Take me with you, he shouted. The words were hardly audible. The sound was animal, an animal enraged. Stay where you are, Snowman yelled. The Quakers stood am- amazed, staring, but it appeared not frightened. The man came on, stumbled, fell. Snowman shot him. He was worried about contagion. Could the Quakers get this thing, or was their genetic material too different? Surely Crake would have given them immunity, wouldn't he? When they reached the peripheral wall, there was another one, a woman. She lurched abruptly out of the the gatehouse, weeping, and grabbed at a child. Help me, she implored. Don't leave me here. Snowman shot her, too. During both incidents, the Quakers looked on in wonder. They didn't connect the noise made by Snowman's little stick with the crumpling of these people. What is the thing that fell down, oh, Snowman? Is it a man or a woman? It has extra skins like you. It's nothing. It's a piece of a bad dream that Craig is dreaming. They understood about dreaming. He knew that. They dreamed themselves. Craig hadn't been able to eliminate dreams. We're, high, we're hardwired for dreams, he'd said. He couldn't get rid of singing either. We're hardwired for singing. Singing and dreams were entwined. Why does Craig dream a bad dream like that? He dreams it, said Snowman, so you won't have to. It is sad that he suffers on our behalf. We are very sorry. We thank him. Will the bad dream be over soon? Yeah, said Snowman, very soon. The last one had been a close call. The woman was like a rabid dog. His hands were shaking now. He needed a drink. It'll, it'll be over when Craig wakes up? Yes, when he wakes up. We hope he will wake up soon. And so they walked together through no man's land stopping here and there to graze or picking leaves and flowers as they went. The women and children hand in hand, several of them singing in their crystal voices, their voices like fronds unrolling. Then they wound through the streets of the plebe lands like a skewed parade or a fringed religious uh, procession. During the afternoon storms, they took shelter, easy to do as doors and windows had ceased to have meaning. Then in the freshened air, they continued their stroll. Some of the buildings along the way were still smoldering. There were many questions and much explaining to do. What is that smoke? Is it a thing of Crake's? Why is that child lying down with no eyes? It was the will of Crake, and so forth. Snowman made it up as he went along. He knew what an improbable shepherd he was. To reassure them, he tried his best to appear dignified and reliable, wise and kindly. A lifetime of deviousness came to his aid. Finally, they reached the edge of the park. 
The snowman had to shoot only two more disintegrating people. He was doing them a favor, so he didn't feel too bad about it. He felt worse about other things. Late in the evening, they came to the shore. The leaves of the trees were rustling. The water was gently waving. The setting sun was reflecting on it, pink and red. The sands were white, the offshore towers overflowing with birds. It's so beautiful here. Oh, look, are those feathers? What is this place called? It's called home, said Snowman.